presentation has two presenters, and uh, the topic here is from prices to business cycles. So a good thing is that we are economists, so we believe in prices. But the sad thing is, uh, actually, we wanted to go the other way around from business cycles to prices, so we could make a lot of money in the stock market. And so, as you know, that's not possible. So. So you get two talks for the price of one, uh, but uh, our team is the same. The first paper is going to cover an asset pricing model, uh, and so it's going to be about consumption business cycles and, and intertemporal substitution. And we're going to exploit the asset pricing equation to identify a price quantity relationship. The second paper is going to cover uh, metal commodity prices and uh, cycles in global industrial production and also global GDP. And it's going to exploit short run restrictions and equilibrium conditions to identify these price quantity relationships. In both of them, we're going to use common feature techniques in estimation and testing. And uh, we are going to illustrate the usefulness of the techniques and the results in empirical exercises. So the first paper, it's like I said before, it's about the stochastic discount factor. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> the first paper is uh, stochastic discount factor using asset pricing, uh, asset prices actually, and it's joint with Fabio Araújo. Uh, so first you may ask yourself, why am I talking about uh, consumption cycles? Because most people like to think about uh, GDP cycles, uh, cycles in output. But if you HP filter consumption in GDP, what you get is uh, the, what's pictured here. So you can see the cycles. These are the cycles in consumption and uh, GDP. And they're very similar, very synchronized. And if you don't like using the HP filter, you can also use Beverage Nelson, the composition. And, and they are very similar too. So talking about one is talking about the other. The difference. Mainly, it's amplitude. So this, this first paper is going to impose no arbitrage to show that the stochastic discount factor is a common feature or a, of asset returns. And common feature, you can think of it as a common factor. The uh, we're going to construct a consistent estimator of, uh, of the stochastic discount factor. And you know, we're going to follow the stochastic discount factor literature started by Harrison, Krebs, and Hansen with several co-authors. And we're going to estimate consistently the M, which is the stochastic discount factor here. And we're not going to use any parametric assumption on preferences, so just prices. So that's why we're from prices to business cycles. And of course, this approach allows to develop uh, no arbitrage estimators of several other quantities of interest, like uh, volatility, conditional volatility, etc. And these are going to be no arbitrage estimator, but I don't have time to go over that today. 
And of course, we have been working a lot on common features in macro most, most of the time and also in econometrics. But there is a, a huge literature on financial econometrics. Most of that is actually reduced form. Not, not all, but most. And our approach, uh, it's going to be structural. And you're going to see how. And, uh, and also we're going to, impo uh, to propose a different way of uh, estimating no arbitrage quantities that are very popular now in financial econometrics after the work of Debode and co-authors. But although we're going to talk about very, you know, intricate uh, 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 quantities in uh, financial econometrics, the techniques we're going to use are very standard. So this is just standard panel asymptotics. So we have two assumptions. First is no arbitrage, like I said before. And uh, just to fix notation here, the asset pricing, that buys you the asset pricing equation. So the price of an asset today is just how much it pays off tomorrow, discounted on expectation given prior information. So that's the asset pricing equation. And of course, we are not going to work with prices and payoffs. We're going to work with returns. So how much do you pay for returns tomorrow? Just one. So the price of returns tomorrow costs today just one. And that holds for every uh, asset in the economy. And as you can see, they are discounted by the same thing, M. That's why it's common. Second. Assumption, well, well that, this assumption buys you M being positive, and also that the law of large numbers is going to hold for gross returns. The second assumption is just discipline. We're going to stack all these returns, multiply by M, take logs, and this thing here is going to be a covariant, stationary, and ergodic process with finite first and second moments. If you cannot uh, compute uh, first and second moments, uh, you cannot do anything. So, and of course, R and M are stationary. As, at least we think of them at, in this way. So, let me go to a special case here where the log, well, well, the log of M R. Is, has a multivariate normal distribution, which is homoscedastic. This is a special case, of course, but it's an interesting one because then we can explicitly solve for the conditional expectation. And if you solve, uh, you get a function of the mean and variance. And if you take logs of that, then what you get is this. And uh, you get the conditional expectation. And what we do then is to recall that we can always decompose a variable as the conditional expectation plus an innovation. That innovation is the martingale difference sequence. And, uh, and of course, then we can combine these two and get rid of the conditional expectation and, and get to the final equation, which just shows that the log of uh, returns for every return, it's equal to minus m, which is the minus the log of the stochastic discount factor, the variance, and then the error, which is unpredictable. So that 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 that's what I mean by a structural form. We're imposing the or, or quasi-structure. We're imposing the asset pricing equation because of no arbitrage. Now, of course, you don't. You may not like using log normality. So I have four other slides here to justify not using that. So in the paper, that's done. You can actually start with a second order Taylor expansion, not being a, a, an approximation, but being an exact equation. Because this term here is evaluated uh, between your expanding the exponential function around x with increment h. But the second order term, which is the higher order term, is evaluated between x and x plus h. So this is an exact equation. And of course, using that, you can uh, get an, uh, an equation for, the, uh, and if you denote h by the log of mri, 
Then you get uh, an equation for that. And of course, if, the, if you take conditional expectation, that's going to cancel out with one. So you can characterize fully the conditional expectation of Z, which is this. And because, and, and again, you can use the Martingale different sequence uh, result before and, and have the, the quasi-structural form that I just got with uh, log normality. And the first people that, well, first paper that exploited the idea that M is a common feature was actually Hansel and Singleton in their famous JPE paper. That's 10 years before Engel and Kozik actually defined what uh, a common feature was. And of course, if you, because we are assuming covariant stationarity, that buys you a world representation. So you can combine that and, and, and and substitute out for the higher order terms. So as you can see, you, you get an equation that's, uh, you know, this term here is substituting in for the variance, essentially. This term and that, okay? So what's the point here? The point is that we can take the, the cross-sectional average and suppose that uh, epsilon is diversifiable so the number of assets goes to infinity. And of course, if epsilon is identifiable, this guy is going to go to zero in the limit. And then we can take and estimate M by a cross-sectional average of the returns. And, and then we only have to do a correction for this bias term here, the average bias. So that's the idea of the paper, basically. And uh, you may be skeptical, and some other people, including previous referees, were. <laughs> that law of large numbers may not hold for epsilon. And there is a reason for that, for the skepticism. Because uh, it's an innovation of log of MRI. And of course, we can, uh, simple algebra, that's the innovation, the log of M, plus the innovation of log of R. And of course, the first, which is the log of M, has no cross-sectional variation. So when you take the cross-sectional average of this guy, you may inherit a function of Q, so the law of large numbers is not going to hold for that. Of course, uh, you have Q here, you have Q here. So what we've done from here to there is just to have like a, a factor model, where Q is the factor, and, and alpha is just the factor loading. Okay, so as you can see here, probability limit of, of the average epsilon to be zero requires that this delta here, which is the covariance over variance, on average to be one in the limit. And of course, we know this is an identification issue in econometrics because we, there is no unique way in which we can separate uh, a factor and a factor loading in factor models. There are infinite ways of doing that. But the interesting thing is that no arbitrage is going to give you the probability limit being zero. Okay? And uh, I'm going to show you how. So no arbitrage is going to give you that. And the only thing you need, you're still allowed to choose a normalization, and once you choose the proper one, then this probability limit is zero. So let me go to the main result. Uh, under these assumptions, you can estimate consistently the stochastic discount factor, or a stochastic discount factor, by, as you can see, by R bar J and R bar A, and R bar J is just the geometric average of the reciprocal of returns. And R bar A is just the arithmetic average of returns. So you, can, you don't need a Fortran code to compute that. You can do it in Excel at home. Even your son can do that in Excel. So that's very straightforward. And of course, uh, we're going to need uh, n and t to go to infinity, but n has to diverge at least at the same rate as t. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to give you a full proof, just the idea. 
And I'm going to use the log normal case here, but in the paper we have the more general proof. But actually the log normal case, it's very similar to the general proof. So you're not going to lose much. So the idea here is that we need to construct, because we, we're going to impose no arbitrage to prove that the, the average epsilon converges in probability to zero. Then, uh, for that we need to construct no arbitrage portfolios. So what is a no, no arbitrage portfolio? It's, it's characterized by weights, W, which when you multiply by one, one, recall that one is the cost of every asset. So this uh, W has to, when, when multiplied by vector of one, has to be zero. That means that you buy some asset, you sell some assets, but the amount you buy and the amount to sell cancel out exactly, so the cost of the portfolio is zero. And that happens also in the limit. And the second condition here tells that the variance of the portfolio as the number of assets increases is zero. So it degenerates, but it can degenerate at any point. So imposing no arbitrage means that the probability limit of this arbitrage portfolio has to be zero. Okay, so now we're going to use that con no arbitrage condition given here and of course respecting those results before. And uh, we're going to apply it to the quasi-structural form. So that's, that's it. So as you can see here the M, this vanishes because the W's cancel out. Um, now I'm going to substitute in the epsilons. First there is the vector of ones and then these deltas. So these are the alpha, alpha uh, coefficients in the factor structure I mentioned before. This is the per pervasive uh, factor and this is completely diversifiable. That's the residual. So of course this goes to zero the first term, as you can see, is a vector of 1, so this goes to 0 as well. So in order to eliminate Q from this expression, I need this vector delta here to be of a certain type. cannot be any vector. So it has to lie on the, on the space of vector of 1s. Otherwise, it doesn't vanish. And if, if Q survives in this, in the limit, what happens? You're going to inherit Q is a, a stochastic process. It can have any value across time, at any point in time. You cannot guarantee that it's going to be zero. So you're going to violate no arbitrage because you're going to get some positive or negative probability limit for sure. So you violate no arbitrage. If you get something positive, you're making money, spending nothing, violation of no arbitrage. If you get a negative number, just multiply all the weights by minus one, you get the positive number, violate no arbitrage. So, that's why it must lie on the space of this guy. So it has to be of the form delta, delta, delta. So that's now, so that's why the normalization is useful because you know it can be anything here as long as it's finite. So that implies that the probability limit of this W epsilon is zero, but that doesn't imply yet that the probability limit of the epsilons is zero. If I compute the probability limit of epsilons, I can see immediately that, that that's equal to one plus delta times Q. So if I choose delta equals to minus one, which is going to still lie in the space of ones, a vector of ones, then the probability limit of epsilon is zero. So, and since I'm allowed to choose the normalization, I'm going to choose minus one. And then that proves that the epsilon is diversifiable. And then I can use the cross-sectional average of log returns to estimate the log of M. All these terms here are, are, are going to vanish. And, uh, and 
the meaning of this identification assumption is just setting up the variance of M to be the variance across time of the probability limit of this uh, cross-sectional average of the R's. So that's the meaning of it. So it, you know, people have used that in the past in different ways. So as I mentioned before, this guy is going to go to zero, but what about, we're going to estimate the log of M, but there is this term here, this bias in the limit. And of course, these are in logs, so this bias here in the level of M is just a tilt, it's a multiplicative term. So I have a consistent estimate, uh, an estimator for the tilted M, and uh, so that's that. That's the geometric average of reciprocal of returns. So what about estimating the tilt? Can I estimate the tilt? And the answer is yes. You go to the asset pricing equation for every asset, multiply by, the, by this term, take the cross-sectional average, take the unconditional mean, and then it's straightforward to show that you can use the correction here to estimate the tilt. And once you estimate the tilt and you have a consistent estimator for the tilted M, just divide one by the other, and that's the formula we had in the main result. So of course, we're not the first ones to propose estimating stochastic dis discount factor using returns. There's a classical paper by Hansen Jaganathan and the second one as well, where they do a projection argument. So what we're doing here is not projection. We're doing uh, a mixture or a combination of returns. So it's a different approach. But the idea is similar. It's to use non-observables to explore, to compute non-observables. And uh, well, so that, that's the essence of econometrics. But the good thing of our method is that as n and t go to infinity, our estimator gets more and more close to the populational parameters. And of course, in Hansen and Jaganathan projection, it works very well for finite n and t, but as especially n goes to infinity, you're going to have problems inverting that matrix because the, it's going to be increasing on size. It's going to be a square matrix, but of very high size. And, and if t is small, you, you, at, as n increases, you can't even invert it. So there are numerical problems. So it's a similar approach, but circumvents some problems that uh, they had here. Of course, they, they, they have an estimator for the mimicking portfolio. And uh, what do we identify? If we have mar complete markets, we're going to identify the unique mimicking portfolio, and that's equal to the unique uh, SDF that prices all assets. But if markets are incomplete, we're going to estimate some positive M. There are infinite M's that price uh, all the assets. And of course, uh, it can be one of them, it can be a convex combination of some of them, it can be anything. But the interesting thing is that they all have the same pricing properties, so that's, you know, not really relevant. So once you get an estimator for, of M, a consistent estimator, you can do, and as you saw, it doesn't depend at all on, on preferences. You can use this estimator to evaluate preference uh, representations or functions. And uh, so I take popular representations here, the power utility, Gamma is the absolute, uh, the relative risk aversion coefficient. Beta is the one period discount factor. External, so there is only one factor here, which is the growth rate of consumption. Um, external habit adds a, a second uh, factor, which is the lagged growth rate of consumption to the current one. And there is a separation uh, coefficient kappa here. I don't know if you can see that. And of course, crepe porter which is very popular, uh, has the consumption growth and the optimal portfolio as two factors. So we can evaluate which of these three is appropriate, if any of those are, and you know, so on, and estimate 
the parameters here as well. We can do that. So let me illustrate that with an exercise. Uh, we're going to use in the exercise more than thousands of assets, although they are going to be in portfolios. So actually, we're going to have 18 portfolios. Some of, of them are, are, of course, stock indices, so they are comprised of thousands of assets already. So we have G7 countries, uh, stock indices, and, and short-term government bonds. We have also gold, tri AAA US bonds, uh, S&P 500, the T-bill, and uh, real estate uh, REITs, uh, returns as well. And of course, uh, we want to do, um, we want to talk about consumption um, cycle, so we have to use quarterly data. And uh, these are, this is the consistent estimator using these 18 portfolios, but of course, underlying that, thousands of assets. As you can see, it fluctuates. Uh, around a little bit, the average is 0.99 in a quarterly basis. Uh, that um, accounts in, in an annual basis 0.97. It's about 3% uh, real discount yearly, which is a sensible number. Uh, of course, some years it's uh, very small, like uh, 0.86, something like that. And some years very high, like 1.1. But on average, it's, it's discounting. So the first exercise, so the exercises are going to use GMM for estimation. And in the similar spirit of uh, Hansen Jagannathan, trying to have the distance of these uh, uh, preference representations to the estimated M. And at the same time, we're going to be able to say something about the estimation error of our model if you know, it's uh, acceptable or not. Um, so, uh, beta is the one period discount factor, gamma is the relative risk aversion coefficient, and here are the results of the over-identifying restrictions test, which is specification test. So the estimates of uh, relative risk aversion, you know, they are a little bit above one, uh, from one point one all the way to 1.4, and the standard errors are relatively small, so they are all, most, mo most of them are significant. Uh, beta, it's uh, a little bit below one, most cases, uh, some cases uh, one or a little bit above. And uh, the over-identifying restriction test doesn't reject the model. If we go to external habit, you can see that uh, beta and gamma estimates don't change very much, but kappa here, it's uh, statistically insignificant in every estimation, as you can see. Very high standard errors. So if kappa is zero, we're back to power utility. And of course, over identifying restrictions test doesn't reject. And finally, we go to crap portail, and uh, theta is the is the, the key parameter to see whether or not the second factor, which is the optimal portfolio return, is important or not. So if theta is one, this term drops out and you're back to power utility again. You can see that's uh, close to one, but statistically different than one, so the standard error is very small. Uh, so we do not... Uh, and, and again, the over-identifying restriction test doesn't reject, so we would prefer the crap portail specification vis-a-vis -vis, um, vis -vis the power utility because the second factor is significant and doesn't drop out. So if I can put this in two graphs, uh, let me do that. This is our estimator in, uh, in red. And this is consumption growth multiplied by minus one. So it's the factor in the power utility case. As you can see, the cyclical pattern is very close, one, very close to one another. But you have several spikes here that, in which they are different. 
these spikes are actually random. So the difference between, uh, there's a linear combination of SDF and consumption growth, which is completely unpredictable. Claudia is going to talk more about this. This is a common cycle between these two guys. But of course, these spikes are very big and they happen often, although they are random. So the correlation coefficient is very small. It's about 0 0.2, 0 0.21. So that means that, uh, that uh, the simple power utility model doesn't fare very well if you want to explain uh, business cycles and using consumption growth. What about the crap or tail model? Well, crap or tail model fare much better. As you can see, they wiggles of uh, they, they are being followed much closely. The correlation coefficient increases from 0.21 to 0.61, which is a big improvement. And we only added one additional factor. Of course, this additional factor is the, uh, if I recall correctly, the S&P 500, no, the New York Stock Exchange uh, uh, return. So. That, of course, improves a lot uh, the way it fits. So at the end of the day, we have, uh, if you want to, uh, we can predict business cycles using asset prices or talk about intertemporal substitution. Uh, we cannot do a very good job just with one factor. If we increase to a second factor, we do much better. And we're able to evaluate uh, uh, models, especially uh, preference models in this case, using these techniques. And we got a consistent estimator of uh, an underlying random variable. Uh, of course, there are a lot of things to do with this technique. It's just the beginning of uh, more uh, long-term research and uh, right now thinking about uh, doing mixed frequency uh, of that because you know you can go you can actually estimate what intertemporal substitution is going to be if you have uh, uh, high frequency data for assets and you combine them in the way that we've done before but that's not being done yet so let me call Claudia to present the second paper. Uh, so I'll continue the subject about common cycles. And the research here was about, uh, uh, we are using metal commodity price to predict the GDP. So we are going the way uh, from metal commodities to business cycles, okay? So just to give uh, the beginning of the presentation, just to start with uh, seeing how we can see the growth rates of GDP and growth rates of industrial production. So you can see from the picture that they are very synchronized. That's the thing we, are, we would like to, to get some advantage because we are going to use IP from GDP and the metals price IP and GDP. That's the way to predict the GDP that we're going to use here. And just, to, just for you to have some idea that this is the copper, uh, the growth rates of copper price and global industrial production, just to see how they are, they are also, the, the cycles are very synchronized also here in this series. So the outline of the talk, I will start with some basic concepts about common features, what they are, features and common features. Then I will... I will show you how we can build econometric models when there are these kind of common features uh, involved. Then I will use the common features that we related with metal prices and industrial production, building a model, adding after GDP in this model. And then we are going to, we are go I'm going to show you the predictability performance of a model that includes metal price when it wants to predict GDP and a model that does not, does not include metal price. Okay. 
So to start with features, and the basic idea is that features, uh, econometric, many economic series, they have many different features, and features is simple. You can see seasonality is a kind of feature, heterosedacity is a kind of feature, and here we are going to deal with trends and serial correlation with past information. So if you think that uh, you have one series, we call here Y1, and the, if the series has property A, it can be a trend, for instance, and you have another series that has the same property, property A, a trend. And you can see uh, this property is common between this series. You can say that this property is common. Whenever you have a linear combination of this series that does not have this, this same characteristic, okay? So this is only a way that mathematically you are going to say that two different or a group of series does not have, uh, does share the same kind of, the same feature, okay? So cointegration is the, the most well-known kind of common feature and it's related to trend. So you can have two dif distinct processes. They both have trend and if this trend is the same, is this, uh, if this trend is shared uh, among this process, you see this process cointegrate, the variables cointegrate. So and another common, uh, common feature is the common cycle. That's more related. This is related with the stationary series. And it means that when you have two series, maybe, or a group of series, and individually they depend on past information, but here we can, if they share this past information, it means that we can build a linear combination of them that does not have any, uh, any, any relation with the past. So it means that this linear combination, it's totally unpredictable, okay? So uh, I was trying yesterday to find something that was uh, uh, more uh, visually easily, easy to see what are common trends. And then I, was, I, I, I entered in Google something like common cycles. And it's difficult. In Google, when you don't know what you're looking for, you can have many distinct things. So João gave me a better example today. So these are the common cycles that we are talking about here, OK? So uh, Engel and Kozik in 1993, they started with the concept of um, common, common features. And they studied the GDP of the United States and Canada. And uh, they, they observed that they found no, no co-integration between this, this uh, series, the GDP. But they found that the growth rate of US and Canadian GDP were synchronized. And here, what you're going to, what we, we start with is the common, common features between the price. And it, it, we analyze the six different metal price and industrial, industrial production. So here is just uh, some equations. But it, what it means when a series shares some common feature with another, it means that the combination, there is a combination that's totally unpredictable. That's only this here, OK? And this is only the econometric model that you have a VAR, that uh, if you have a group of series, you write them like this. So if they share common features, you can write in a different way your system. I'll show you better. This is, uh, this is like a vacuum model. You have all the series depending on past history of all the legs, all the variables in the system. What we want to do uh, we know already that if you, we have a series that, that has common cycles with past values, what we can do, we can write some of these uh, equations in our system in a much more simple form. They only depend on other variables in the system, but they do not depend on the past of all the variables included. So um, this is how we test the model. So we have no way to, to say uh, in the beginning that this, this, this series share some common feature, but we are going to do, we is to estimate a model, we have the J statistic, we have the J test, and then we can see the p-value, and uh, if it's not, if the model is well specified, it's okay. So we believe that there are some, there are common features, there are common cycles between them. So the, these are the ways you can estimate. So if from the empirical exercise, we start with the metals price, okay? So in the first exam in the first moment, we were studying common cycles between metals, and the idea was, okay, uh, they seem to be correlated, and there were, uh, since in 1996, these guys said, uh, Dito and LaHawk stressed the importance of demand factors on commodity price, and we think that from theory and microeconomic theory, you can imagine that, uh, like, metals are input for firms, 
So the problem of the firm, minimizing costs, they, uh, they come up with the optimal demand from the firm, demand for inputs. And we can think that in the, uh, this supply for this in the short term, supply is, is fixed. So in fact, if we are thinking about metals, commodities, you know that supply, you can think that supply, is, it's reasonable to think it's fixed because it will take a lot of long time for firms to increase production. So just uh, thinking that in equilibrium, demand equals supply, if we total differentiate these equations, this is the important result here. This is positive correlation, meaning if, if that industrial production wants to increase output, prices of input will increase. So that's the thing we are seeing in the graph. Also, in the short term, this will this work. So, okay, if we want to, this is the basic kind of model we are estimating here. We put price and look that this is a, this could be a, if it was a very complete model, all the equations depending on past history, history, we will have a lot of parameters here. We only have the price of metals depending on industrial production, and industrial production depends on past history. This means that the price of the price of metals, price of uh, the price of metal here depends and has a linear combination with industrial production that's totally unpredictable. This is the this is the common feed, this common cycle that we are trying to investigate. Okay. So we investigate that kind of system of equations for six metals here, using global industrial production, and this the blue here they, we found they shared some common cycles with global industrial production because of we could not we could not. Uh, reject the hypothesis that the model was correct specified. But as we want to investigate the GDP and connect all this story, all these facts with the GDP, we, we investigated also on, on a quarterly basis, sorry, on a quarterly basis. So for on a quarterly basis, we found that aluminum, copper, and tin shared some cycles with industrial production. And then, um, okay, so because, now we are going to add the GDP to this model, just to see if we, we in fact, our aim is to, to forecast GDP. So just in the beginning, I showed you that GDP and IP, they not only, coin, they not only have share common trends, they, all, they also sh share common cycles. So here is the model, the, the model that we included GDP with the three metals that first we found some correlation with industrial production. And here in this model, what we did, all the variables we tried, all the variables sharing, sh all, all the variables sharing some common cycle with industrial production, even GDP, and we estimated the whole system, the parameters uh, for for these these were estimated as well. Okay, this is the standard deviation, and we could not reject this model. This is the p-value of the statistics, so it seems the model is okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, okay, uh, uh, we can. We can decompose series in a very uh, special way when we have this kind of, uh, when we have the number of cointegration, the number of uh, linear combinations that eliminates trends and the number of combinations that eliminates cycles. Uh, is the, when we sum up them and the, it's equal to the number of variables in our system. So there is a special kind of uh, trend and cycle decomposition and we use it so we, here we have the trend of GDP, and we have cycles in GDP from the method we use there. Industrial production, the same thing, uh, trend and cycles. And here for industrial production and metals. So you have the cycles here, in black line is the industrial production, and you have these this, this metals here, you can see cycles in metals are much more pronounced, much more pronounced. Okay, so, Okay, this is just the, the simple model with a, GD, a model that does not consider metals, only GDP and industrial production, also with common cycles. And this is the result of the, our forecast using um, a, a metal with all the three metals and a metal that uh, does not include, uh, and a, a system that does not include the metals. These are the error of our forecast exercise out of sample forecast. So you can see one, step, one quarter ahead to eight quarters ahead. This is the error of our GDP projection, okay? So uh, this, uh, uh, these first two, the, two the five horizons ahead, these errors, 
these errors are statistically different from the other models, so we would prefer in the first moment to use this, to use the model with metals to predict GDP. This is just, uh, okay, this is the forecast of the model, one step ahead forecast of our GDP using metals, the, the, the model we found more interesting. And okay, we, so the conclusions is that we found uh, widespread evidence of com common cycles between metal commodity price and global industrial production and also GDP. And these common cycles were incorporated to econometric models and it could Im improve the performance of our forecast for business cycles. So that's, that's it.